Alrighty guys, this is module six, correlation and experimentation. Okay, so correlations. So correlations are easy to kind of apply, especially to like survey research. Um, but there are also kind of studies that are done that are not true experiments that can also produce correlational research. So for example, some correlations. Um, a study finds that increased parental support for college results in lower grades. That means that when parents give more support, there is a relationship between more support and lower grades. Um, or people with mental illness are more likely to be smokers. I want you to pay attention to the language here. Increased parental support, more likely. A correlation cannot state this causes this. Rather, it can state that this is related to this. So um, dis describing behavior is really the first step to toward predicting it. And oftentimes, descriptive methods can tell us how one trait relates to another, which is what we call correlating. Um, so in psych, we use a number called a correlation coefficient to tell us how closely two things vary together and how well one predicts the other. So let's say I want to know the correlation coefficient between height and weight. How does height relate to weight? And when we do this research, what we would find is that actually it's a pretty strong positive relationship, meaning as height goes up, weight typically also goes up. So that correlation coefficient would probably be a positive 0 0.6 or higher, I would, I would assume. Um, that's a pretty strong relationship. So the closer to either positive one or negative one, doesn't matter the direction, uh, indicates the strength of the relationship. The direction only tells you how the, the relationship is working. Um, so for example, uh, if you're spending more time um, playing video games, then you are going to have less time to study. That would be an example of a negative relationship where one variable goes up, the other goes down. A positive relationship is where the two variables move together. So um, to demonstrate correlations, we use scatter plots like you see here. So this is what a positive correlation looks like. Um, so it goes up or it can also both go down, um, which is like it's the same thing. And then a negative correlation goes like this because as one variable is high, the other is low in values. And then there can be no correlation where it looks pretty random in the data. Now, um, a mini test yourself. We'll do this together in class actually, so just skip that for now. But what you need to understand about correlations is correlations do not prove causation. All it tells us is that these two things are related not that this one causes another. There are lots of things that are correlated that are not causal. And the only way you can determine a causal relationship is through experiments. Okay, now, um, there are these things that humans like to do where we create what we call illusory correlations. So sometimes humans can see or believe that two things are related when really they are not. So this is what we call an illusory correlation. It's when humans perceive a relationship where none exists or perceive a stronger than actual relationship. So some examples of this are the full moon and odd behavior. People think that when the full moon comes out, odd behavior occurs. And that's basically because if you already have that belief, it's going to be a lot easier for you to remember when that belief is confirmed versus when that belief is not confirmed. Your brain just will not remember every time there was a full moon and nothing weird happened. And the opposite will, will over remember every time there was a full moon and things that were weird did happen. Um, and so this is kind of another kind of logical issue humans run into. 
And correlations, especially when we plot out the data, like on a scatter plot, can help see if there is actually any truth to that correlation. Now, another phenomenon that kind of feeds this false belief of control that illusory correlations give us is regression towards the mean, which is a statistical phenomenon that is the tendency for extreme or unusual scores or events to fall back towards the average. So let's say you wear your favorite pair of, your lucky pair of socks on a um, given game and you do really well in that game. Well, naturally, the next time you play, it's probably going to be more close to the average than that extreme example. But people perceive the extreme example as being attributed to the socks rather than just naturally kind of going back to normal. And that's kind of what can keep fueling this um, logical error. And then here's an example kind of how, how this might apply to like a, like a team. Like if you, if your favorite team is the Raiders, um, if you wear a Jersey and you're watching the match and your team wins, you are way more likely to remember that event than if you're wearing the Jersey and watching the match and your team loses. So that's kind of how illusory correlations work. Okay. Then experimentation. So experimental manipulation, um, so there's an example in your textbook about how breastfed infants develop higher child IQ scores than bottle-fed infants with an average of three IQ points. Now, why does this occur? They did some correlational research and found that there was a correlation in that babies that were breastfed and for a long amount of times typically had higher IQ scores than babies that were not. But we didn't know why. And we couldn't isolate for sure that it was the breast milk. And the only way for us to do that is to conduct an experiment, which is a research method in which an investigator manipulates one or more factors to observe the effect on some behavior or mental processes. Now, by using random assignment of participants, the, um, the experimenter aims to control other relevant factors. Now, we'll talk about all this in a moment. But basically, first thing to have an experiment, you have to be able to control a variable. In this case, we're going to want to control whether the babies are receiving breast milk or not. Then once you have the variable you're going to uh, manipulate, you need to create some groups. So you're going to have an experimental group, and this is the people who are going to receive the treatment. In this case, the experimental group would be the babies who receive breast milk. Then you need something to compare those babies to. You need another group so you can have some comparison. And this is called our control group. So in the control group, the people, the participants in the study should not receive the treatment or should receive a placebo. So in this case, we'll say maybe a bottle fed baby, uh, a formula fed baby. Now, to make sure though, that we don't have um, any confounding variables, which we'll talk about in a moment, but to make sure that we don't have any variables that are affecting the study, like let's say a person's um, age, we have to make sure that we use random assignment to place people in either the experimental group or the control group. So the experimental group, or I mean random assignment is used to just basically place people, and they use computerized random generators to do that. Um, so they get their sample of people that they're studying and they randomly assign them to either the experimental group and the control group. Now, a very important thing in administering an experiment is to try to eliminate as many variables as possible. And so we want to ensure actual cause and effect. So oftentimes researchers will use what we call a placebo, which is an inert substance or treatment that makes the people in the control group think they're also receiving the treatment. So let's say I want to study the effects of this new drug on um, anxiety reduction. Um, in my experimental group, I'm going to give them the actual drug. In my control group, I'm going to give them a fake drug that looks and smells and tastes exactly like the real one, but they don't know that. And the reason why we do this is because there is a thing that happens among humans called the placebo effect. When we think we are receiving a treatment, 
we can actually improve in our behavior, in our symptoms, whatever it is that the researchers are looking for, just by believing that. So examples of this is like, if I give a person a cup of coffee and I did not tell them that it was decaffeinated, we find that people report higher feelings of energy, that greater productivity, so on and so forth. Another kind of um, pop culture example of this is in Harry Potter, when um, Harry gives Ron the, the serum to help him have his liquid luck, well, he doesn't give him a real thing, but Ron thinks that and plays an awesome game of Quidditch. So that's the placebo effect. Now, to further prevent any bias or outside variables, researchers should use a double blind procedure if they're able to. So in a double blind, what that means is, so there's the researchers who are running the study. They then hire people to administer the treatments. So in a double blind, neither the people administering the treatments or the participants know if they're getting the real treatment or a placebo. And the reason why this is important is because it eliminates or prevents experimenter bias which is when an experimenter knows of their own hypothesis, they may unintentionally skew the data to support their idea. And I'll talk about an example of this with teachers. Um, but really quickly, if I think my third period class is my smartest class, and I were the one collecting the data on that, the issue is that I may actually unintentionally teach them better because I think they're smarter, and that would then be producing those results rather than the inherent um, intelligence of those students. That's what we want to prevent. So with double blinds, it does prevent that because the people who are giving the treatment or the, place, um, or the drug are unaware of who's getting what, as are the participants. Okay. And then lastly, um, independent and dependent variables. Now, you need to know how to do this. We're going to have practice with this in class. But let's take this example of the breastfed infants when it was actually put to the test in an experiment. So with parental permission, one British research team directly experimented with breast milk. They randomly assigned 424 hospitalized preemie infants either to formula feedings or to breast milk feedings. Their finding on intelligence tests taken at age eight, those nourished with breast milk scored significantly higher than those who were formula fed. Now, like I said, in an experiment, you have to manipulate at least one variable. And that variable that we're manipulating is called the independent variable. So let's say I want to test a drug on how good it is at reducing anxiety symptoms. In that case, the independent variable, the thing I am changing, the thing I am giving to the people or giving a placebo of would be the drug. The dependent variable is basically the effect. It is the uh, factor that is being measured. And so in that same example, if I'm looking at the effects of this drug on anxiety symptoms, my dependent variable would be the number of anxiety symptoms because the number of anxiety symptoms depend on whether or not they received the drug or the placebo. Now, one more thing about um, experiments is that if we do not make sure to account for uh, everything we can, using a double blind, using placebos, using random assignment, that's key. Sometimes confounding variables can creep in and alter the effects of the study. So let's say I'm studying the effects of uh, a certain test preparation program and success on the SAT. Well, if I don't randomly assign my students or my, my participants into the experimental group and the control group, I could accidentally put all of my smartest students in the experimental group. And that would be a confounding variable because 
rather than the test prep program being the cause of the effect, the cause here could be the IQ of those people because I didn't randomly assign. So we have to make sure that we use random assignment and if possible, use blind procedures to eliminate bias as much as possible. And then lastly, when we are trying to make a good study, one of the key things is to try to make it valid, is to have high validity. And high validity means the experiment will test what it is supposed to test. So if I'm looking for IQ, if I'm testing for IQ and I'm asking, you know, people to sing a song as a measure of IQ, that would have low validity. Um, we want to make sure that we're testing for what is supposed to be tested. Um, and so there are methods that we do like with all of these uh, things like random assignment, blind procedures, random sampling that helps to increase validity. Now, I want you to apply this study and identify the independent variable and the dependent variable. Um, and we will check that together in class. And then lastly, I'd like you to test yourself on these questions, which we will also discuss in class. And I'll see you later. Bye.